Hey, what's up, everybody? Pastor Jamie here, Pastor Tony, with an another, another, and another, another one word, one word. Okay, another uh, episode for our podcast here at church. Um, today, we're going to talk a little bit about the beginning of our church, the start of our church, how we got to where we are, and ultimately leading into a note burning service um, that we have planned in a couple of days. So, um, let's start in. I was 27 years old. The Lord spoke to me. True story. I have it written down in one of my prayer logs. He said, when you turn 30, I'm going to unlock something for you. I had no clue what that meant. On, my, on the day after my 30th birthday, the overseer called me and said, would you consider moving your congregation from Conway, um, Coastal Carolina area to Myrtle Beach and taking over this facility? You remember that moment? Yeah, I, re- I remember uh, leading up to that when when we found out that this was even a remote possibility. Um, and, and I remember it's, it's like one of those things in life where you think, wow, it'd be really cool to have a Lamborghini. And then when somebody says, hey, you know, I got a Lamborghini. And then you start thinking, oh, man, I don't know if I can afford insurance. I don't yeah. know if I can do this. I don't know if I can do that. I was just like dreaming. Yeah, it was totally us. Yeah. yeah. We had no clue what we were getting into and really, honestly, weren't really ready for what we got. No, nowhere close to ready. Yeah, our entire monthly morg or our, our entire monthly budget in Conway at Coastal um, was about four thousand dollars a month, and we move in here with our mortgage alone fifty four hundred dollars a month. Yeah, it was. It was definitely a, one of those faith moments where, if if this wasn't God, we would fall on our face and would not we would not make it. Yeah, you know there there was no. There was no, all right, we're close to this. We were nowhere close. And even still, knowing it was God, there were still moments where we could have thrown in the towel and given up because there were plenty of opportunities for this to be way too big that we couldn't handle. Yeah, for sure. Challenges left and right and and just really trying to find the heart of God on, okay, th- th- there were certainly moments of, I th- in the beginning, man, I know you did this. Hallelujah, man. We walked through the doors. This is amazing. And then it was moments of, I think you did this. Yeah, because it was an answer to prayer. We had, we had kind of grown to a place at my mom and dad's facility to where um, we, we talk about it as a kid growing up in a house and they become teenagers and then ultimately um, young adults and they're still living at home. And it's almost like two adults trying to live in the same house with different sets of rules and they're struggling against each other. And that's how it felt at the end, towards the end with my parents. Yeah, I remember that we went and looked at a at the facility that HTC has now in front of Coastal, or in front of Tech, and because that was for sale, it had been for sale for years, and I remember us walking in there, and because of that, because of, man, we've got to do something, this is phenomenal, the opportunity that they've given us, but we we now have outgrown this, this situation a little bit, and I remember us walking in there, looking around and dreaming, again, it was, Total dreams because the refitting that would have had to been done to that building was the purchase of that building. Everything to do with that building was so far beyond what we had access to, or what we were able to do. It was truly just almost pie in the sky dreaming, but we knew we had to do something. And so I remember going in there and it wasn't, sh- but shortly after that of when, when I left the HTC, what's now HTC building, uh, when I left there, I know that I felt a little deflated because we knew we had to do something. And we said, hey, here's a possibility. I remember we even emailed those guys that owned it and just said, hey, will you take, I don't remember what it was, let's say 50 cent. Um, it was something so small, because that's all we had. Yeah. But, and I remember when we when that didn't work out, uh, I, I felt deflated, and I'm sure you felt a little bit of that too. And it's just one of those God moments where where we say, I don't, I don't see, I don't see a way out. And then all of a sudden he just like parts the waters. Yeah. And then we get here and um, truly way too much to handle. We were in over our heads, just determined, refusing to give up. And um, the, the facility was um, needing some attention. I guess that'd be the best way to put it. We had a leaky roof. I remember altar services where we had one of those, I guess it's 50 gallon, 30 gallon, whatever it is. Um, trash cans in the middle of the altar as water is pouring in through the roof and I'm trying my best to preach. I remember one service during the middle of worship where a ceiling tile had gotten so wet from the leak um, in the roof that the ceiling tile just fell on the stage. 
right in the middle of worship, freaked everybody out. Um, so the, the building definitely needed some attention and some upkeep whenever we got here. Yeah, talk about God moments. Of all the towels that we had fall through the years because of rain and leaks, we never had one fall on anybody. Yeah. How in the world did that happen? I don't know. Uh, I remember for me, around that same time, of, of we walk in one Sunday and a tile had busted over the sound booth. Yeah. And all those electronics back there that don't respond well to water. Uh, I mean, we lost, we, we lost light controllers. We, we lost um, CD replicators. All these things, that stuff you don't need now. But just, I remember that and thinking, if this would have been five feet over, it would have ruined our sound. It would have, we, we would have had no sound on Sunday morning. And just, but yeah, so many times that we had uh, just leaks everywhere. And it was just a rough shape. Yeah, we had um, people breaking into the church. You remember yeah. that? We had a vending machine outside. <laughs> um, them, them prying into that. I remember them breaking into the church and, I'm stealing a couple of guitars and um, yanking TVs off the wall. We had those TVs in the foyer, yep. just yanked them off the wall and um, carried them with them out. The one that couldn't get off the wall, so they just hit it with a baseball bat. Just hit it with a baseball bat instead. Um, yeah, I mean, it was an absolute, incredibly crazy journey. And and partner on top of that, us being so broke because the bills were so much and we were in way over our head, partner um, a broken TV on the wall or a leaky roof or any of that stuff. And and it was just, uh, honestly, we were at a place to where we just couldn't afford to fix certain things. We just couldn't afford to replace a TV. We couldn't afford to um, to fix a roof. People always ask me, well, why did you, why did you, you know, leave the roof leaking yeah. for that long? And the, the cheapest bid we got was $30,000 and we got one upwards of $80,000 to fix the roof. So we were just in a place to where we, all we could do was at some point just preach, sing, love people and keep the lights on. Yeah. I, I think, um, back to, you know, the, the TV and I remember it was, it wasn't a situation like a lot of churches and thankfully, if, if a TV breaks tomorrow, thankfully, we can go buy a new TV. Yeah. Um, but I remember, okay, well, let's get a coat of paint. Let's take those screws out the wall. Let's get a coat of paint. And, and that's going to be a bare wall for a while. It was, uh, it was, it was decisions like that that um, really, I think, shaped uh, the frugality that we've had throughout the entireness of, of our ministry. Uh, people who, who are on boards with us and, and who know a lot about the church finances, we are frugal. Yeah. And I think it's all birthed from those yeah. types of situations. <laughs> it's birthed from necessity, right? It's not frugal when, when you don't have any money. <laughs> um, how about the first time we went to two services? You remember that? Absolutely. I remember I'm sitting at the front of the church. Praise the Lord. This is such an incredible, um, incredible moment for me. I remember sitting at the front of the church. Worship was already happening. And Maddie came running into me. And it was almost like a dream. She came running into me and she said, um, there are people turning around and leaving because there's no seats and no parks and, and no parking spots. And I got up in front of the church at maybe like that after the first few songs, um, you know, exhortation moment in service. And I said, hey, next week we're going to do two services. That was a terrible idea. I, I rem Yeah, I remember it being a terrible idea. It was. Because I remember... Um, when you when you when you go from you know a place that seats thirty to a seat uh, a place that seats a hundred to a place that seats you know two hundred, and every time your goal is to reach the most amount of people you can for the kingdom, and you know get butts in seats, and then when you sit there and you're like, hey, awesome, I got this great idea. We're gonna cut this in half. You yeah. know that that wasn't a great idea because then the people who come that was that, that was our thing is, oh my goodness, you know, the people who are used to coming to this service, when they go to the next service, they're going to think it's empty and nobody wants to be on a sinking ship and they're going to think it's dying. And and there were moments of that. There were moments of, oh my goodness, this was a horrible, horrible idea. Um, but yeah, I learned a lot there. Yes. <laughs> I learned um, a lot about planning and getting people on your team as you're, um, as you're journeying through decisions. I learned a lot about gaining wise counsel and making sure that um, other people have filtered through your decisions. And so we have ultimately since then multiple times went to, even after that, we, we fought through and got two services healthy to where ultimately we had to go to three services, to which then we knocked out the wall and went to 
um, back to two services, but then ultimately had to go back to three services again, to which then we knocked out the wall again and had to go, you know, were able to then go back to one service, which was amazing, but then ultimately grew to the place of two services. And then now we're at four services on Sundays. Yeah, I think I remember a lot of just the persistence of it. Um, yeah. it, it took persistence because I remember conversations between me, you, and, and several of the leaders uh, concerning, okay, this, this does this isn't going well. Honestly, conversations that we've had recently about some things um, and, and those things just like this has, have been powered through until they begin to work. And so the persistence was the thing that's, that I think when you're a small church and you've never done two services and then you've never done three and so on and so forth, um, you, you don't know if it'll work. And it's just one of the things of following, following God and following um, just, just the only thing you know to do and you just make it work. And I think that's the thing that we learned through that is, is number one, multiple, multi, multiple services will work. And but you cannot just give up on them as soon. Yeah, as it you. gives it gives people the opportunity to volunteer more. Yeah. You know, right now, if you're in one, if we're in one service, we're cutting down our volunteer for you know to a quarter, and that's dangerous because ultimately Christ came to serve, and we should be you know a servant as well. So yeah, I think you know talking about volunteering that that was one of our early struggles, and I remember that, and it's always been a struggle. You know, and I'm sure it is in every church. I was say, yeah. in, every, in every church, volunteers is the thing. But um, sometimes with our struggles now with volunteers, when you hear a department saying this or that, you look back on the people that have been here since we got here and think, wow, we were we were trying to do the same thing with eight people. Yeah, for you know, sure. Eight volunteers. Um, I, I, I'm going to I'm going to talk about my most memorable story since I've been here. And as I do, I want you to be thinking about, you know, maybe you're you know, a, a story that stands out to you about our time here, okay? So here goes mine. Um, I don't know, maybe maybe seven years ago or so, we decided to do a series called The Ultimate Warrior. <laughs> um, I am a huge wrestling fan, have been my whole life. Um, I, I had, you know, the little dolls, they were about this big. They, we called them, rest, I think they were called wrestling buddies. Um, I had the you know, the Hulk Hogan, the Macho Man, the Ultimate Warrior. I was a huge wrestling fan as a kid. And so we go into this series called Ultimate Warrior, which the concept being that Christ in us, he is the ultimate warrior, paid the price on the cross. It was a really cool series. Um, but you, being the creative mind that you are, took a little different turn into the Ultimate Warrior concept and you decided instead of using, let's say, Christ hanging on a cross as our title screen, you used the face, the painting of the ultimate warrior, kind of because he wore face paint. Um, right. It was the, the font that I used um, was I, it kind of morphed into the ultimate warrior face kind of thing. But it was his, it was yeah, that yeah, yeah. face painting concept. And yeah. so... We were a week and a half into the new series. Our our first sermon had posted. We had we had, you know, promoted the series. We go into the series. We post the first sermon on YouTube. Um, we you know are going into week two of the series, and we get an email, and then a certified letter from the Ultimate Warrior himself, saying, "A, hey, this is a cease and desist order, and you cannot use." My likeness in likeness or name we or even call name it that. we couldn't even call it the ultimate warrior, which most people would be like, "Why does you know it has nothing to do with him?" I took it as a huge compliment that Ultimate Warrior even knew that we were doing a series on him because we had sixty people. <laughs> you know, it, it it wasn't like listen if if Stephen Furtick next week does Ultimate Warrior, it makes sense that right that somebody knows about it. But we were just oh my goodness, somebody somebody's actually right. Heard How cool is this that, that the Ultimate Warrior? Is watching our YouTube videos. This I mean, is amazing. We had, we had meticulously cut out the letters <laughs> "Ultimate Warrior," laminated oh, them, man. had them up on the wall, and I remember going up there and like having to defeatedly take off trash the, all of them. Ultimate. We were we were able to keep Warrior, but we had to yeah. take off all. Yeah, the, so we changed it to Warrior yeah, and Warrior and, the rest of the time. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. You got a you got a story stands out to you? Yeah, I mean, to me, multiple stories all in one, and it's just the 
the demolition that we've been involved in. Um, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm been that way since I was a kid. I love tearing stuff up. And I remember, um, I remember tearing out walls of the offices. I remember, um, numerous, uh, of us, uh, just having a good time during the demolition sessions of just throwing hammers at walls. Uh, the walls that were coming down, uh, weren't destroying anything that we were going to use, but you know, just, just throwing stuff at them and having a good time. And honestly, whoever was here with us at the time, uh, just had a good time with demolition. I remember, I remember people falling, uh, you know, we were up there doing some construction, a guy falling through the roof. During the yeah, Randy Conrad, I love yeah. you, buddy. If you're listening, man, yes. uh, thank God the the Lord protected you in that moment. Yes. Uh, okay, so so demolition, we've done. We we expanded the sanctuary yeah. the first time. We expanded the sanctuary the second time. We um, changed the stage changed around. Stage. We changed the conference room. It was a and also took out that door that used to be to the right. There used to be a door leading in that way, um, and yeah. we took it out. We expanded the foyer. Totally, completely we did the four-year. There used to be offices up there. Um, where the cafe is now used to be a, a conference room and had a like a yep. little office area there. We took that out. Kids, Which, that I think uh, goes to speak to the frugalness that we talked about before. I think one, a, a, if I have to say a memorable story about construction, it is the office that was in there, uh, how we took sawzalls, sawzalls yeah. and cut the office into four-foot sec- the office wall into four-foot sections and took them like Legos over to our new office that we're building and used those to set up the conference room. So the, con- story. the conference room that you go into right now, if you're, if you're ever in, it used to be in the other building and was just brought over like Legos True story. Uh, to save money. You remember the carpet where there were actual concrete, like where, where the walls were when we expanded and we couldn't afford to replace the carpet. So there were like, oh, yeah. like concrete slats. In the middle of the of the sanctuary, yes. all over the church, where yes. we couldn't afford to change the carpet. So, so picture this: you've got you know this burgundy carpet that's been here since 1997, and it it looks great. It's nice uh, champagne color. It's great. But then all of a sudden, just picture this in your head: um, just two inch, three, inch, four inch, just runs. Yeah, it was two by four, so it had to be yeah, four yeah, inch. Yeah. yeah four inch runs that would just go for like eight feet randomly. And you could literally walk through the sanctuary and see the outline of the old offices because there was no carpet there and there was nothing for us to do because we didn't have the, you know, five, $6,000 to replace the whole carpet. And, and we've tried to paint the the concrete. Yep. We painted it. I think the final color was black, wasn't it? Yeah. Painted it black or something like that. Just so it wouldn't be the bright shade of gray that it was because we were going to fool people. Then we went into Kids Point. We changed it from it was a big um, open open fellowship hall. Um, we changed it over and over and over again, but ultimately got it to where it is now. Um, the office, what well, is the office buildings now, were a gymnasium. It was our Hispanic church at one time. Then yep. a gymnasium. When we got here, it was a uh, it was a day school. Day school, right? And, right. Which was basically just an open area. Yep. But, so um, now yeah. it's in our office areas, and then ultimately our team building that was just a um, triple wide portable that somebody donated to the church, yep. and um, and when it moved in here, it was about to fall apart, falling apart. It was, and literally had, I call them angels, two or three different incredible men of God that just came that didn't even come to church here, honestly, at the time, and they just came, saw the need, and said, "Hey, let me fix up that building for you," and. It was, same thing with Kids Point. Yeah. Uh, Kids Point, we yeah. had, we're not great construction people. We do our best, um, but I mean, Kids Point, we had renovated that ourselves several times, and and we had it's a you know fourteen foot ceiling, and we had eight foot walls going and separating all the rooms, and it just looked horrible. And uh, it just one of those angels came along and said, "Hey, let me just do this for you." What's what's a lesson we learned along the way? I, I can think of. You know, quite a few things that I've learned through the years. But what's something if you look back over the last 10 years in this facility and God's faithfulness and his hand with us, what's something that you would say, man, this is just a lesson that I learned through the years? I think, number one, just that, that, that he is with us because, good gracious, he's we, faithful, man. We, we would we would have failed miserably a long time ago and just his faithfulness throughout the whole process. His faithfulness when we made bad decisions. 
yeah. um, of protecting us and showing us a different way. Um, you know, we, we've seen that in so many ways. Um, yeah, for sure. I, I would say one of the lessons that I've learned through the years is that people will come and go uh -huh. um, and it's okay because God is here. He is, he is steady. He is steadfast. And we have seen so many incredible, awesome people of God walk in our church and for whatever reason, ultimately leave our church and the, the, the four walls of the church haven't kept them. My preaching hasn't kept them. The worship hasn't kept them. Um, and, and ultimately the presence of God is still here no matter who comes and who goes. Yeah, I agree. Um, that's, that has been impactful, uh, in a lot of ways when, when you're, when you're young and you have to process that and you don't know how to process that and you think that it's an indictment on you, uh, you think I still it's still do. I still think that yes. sometimes, you know, yeah. and that's, and it's hard to get past. It's hard to get past the, the, just like we were called out of a ministry into this ministry um people are called out of this ministry into another ministry and that's that's hard for any pastor any leader to to deal with because of the the amount of time that you pour into them and the the amount of effort that you give and praise god for god being able to take those people and use them yeah so um for any of you who are watching this who are young in the ministry and you've got a mountain way too big in your life for you to handle or for you to feel like you can um, ultimately navigate. Let me just encourage you, both of us here in this moment, just encourage you um, that that people will come, they'll go, but ultimately the hand of God with you will protect you, provide, he will lead, he will guide through the process. And at the end of the day, you'll stand not because of the people who you think are so valuable to your ministry, you'll stand because of ultimately his presence being there with you. So when we moved into this ministry, let's let's kind of let's kind of shift into um, the thought process of of paying off our facility. Kind of give some background information, and then we'll kind of tell um, ultimately what we're doing, where we what happened, and then how we are where we are. Okay, so when we move into this facility, um, again, four thousand dollars was our entire monthly budget. We come here, fifty four hundred dollars is the mortgage here alone. We tried to refinance. We weren't old enough as a church for them for a bank to trust us to refinance. So we were stuck with a fifty-four hundred dollar a month mortgage payment um, for seven years, um, six years, and so we scratch clawed tooth and nail, and ultimately owed five hundred eighty thousand dollars whenever we got here. Yep. I'm going to get some of these numbers wrong, but that's why you're here to correct me. So five hundred eighty thousand dollars we owe when we got here. Um, we knew God had sent us. We have a mortgage way too big for us to bear. It hindered us from being able to do anything, from being able to do any sort of ministry. Literally, all we could do was preach, sing, love people, and um, keep the lights on. That's literally all we could do. All we could do. Um, so fast forward to um, our anniversary service in 2019. I was preparing for the anniversary service, and I remember the Lord speaking to me and saying, um, to every, every year going into January or coming out of January, we have a thing called sacred season. And I remember the Lord speaking to me and saying, cast the vision for sacred season to pay off the church and use the story of Miss Darlene. Now, Miss Darlene is the, uh, I'll say she's our oldest member. She may not be exactly our oldest member, but one of our top two, three oldest members inside of our church. And the first year of sacred season, Miss Darlene gave a thousand dollars towards um, the project that we were doing. And and Ms. Darlene lives on a fixed income. She didn't have $1,000, but she trusted and believed in the vision that I was casting to be able to um, sow seed into that. So 2019, I use Ms. Darlene's story, and I say, September 2019, I say, okay, hey, here goes what I'm wanting. I'm wanting every family, every adult to give $1,000 towards paying off our mortgage. And at that time, we owed um, $450,000, something of that nature, and so um, it was incredible to see the heart of the people trust me and believe that I had heard the voice of God. We did have some people through that process that say, hey, why would we do this? We could invest this money in ministry. And I didn't really know the answer. I just knew that God had spoke and this is the direction I wanted to go. Even some of our board members that didn't fully understand but said to me, Pastor, if you believe God spoke, then 
then we'll go there and we'll do what you're saying to do. So um, 2019, end of 2019, we go into sacred season starting January 2020. And it was incredible, had a great sacred season, had an incredible outpouring. Um, I think ultimately we had about $280,000 come in. $280,000 come in that we put directly towards our mortgage. Um, $245,000 come in that we put directly towards our mortgage. And um, even even that was something where people were like, well, why don't you do? And I'm like, no, no, no. This is the vision that God gave. This is what people gave towards. So this is where this money's going. And little did we know that this was going to be a huge deal. 2020 was going to be bonkers. And you were going to see how valuable it was long term to have a paid off facility to be able to do ministry out of um, without the without the threat of being shut down because you couldn't meet together or whatever the situation was. So 2020 comes, we see, you know, shutdowns, we see pandemic, we see racial tension, we see um, an, an, an election that's absolutely crazy. And then we go into 2021, where again, our anniversary service, I'm casting vision again to say, hey, there's still meat on the bone. Let's pay off this mortgage. And so we go into 2021 and we we are are honestly leading into that moment. I was really praying about it. And I was like, God, you you gotta speak to me. You gotta, you gotta tell me what this looks like. You gotta tell me what this is going to do. Like, give me fresh vision so that I can renew the people's hope in this vision. And um, the Lord spoke to me and he said, This was the debt that the people thought were going to kill you. This is the bill that was going to destroy your ministry. This was the bill that the enemy had set up for you to destroy you and the work that I had in store for you. So when this is paid off, you're going to see, and, and I, I think it's a little bit of the, you know, the, the slave is, is, is I mean, the, the borrower is slave to the lender. I think it's a little bit of that concept in a spiritual sense where we don't fully understand what happens in the natural actually translates to the supernatural very well and to the spiritual very well. And so ultimately, God spoke and said, when you pay this off, you're going to see me do a lot of the things that you've been praying for and asking for for a long time. You're going to see me unlock those inside of your inside of your church. And so we cast that vision. People jumped on board. We saw it again. Everybody um, gave. It was incredible. We paid off our church. We're celebrating. We're rejoicing. And now we come out of sacred season and we're starting to see God do just incredible things. We're seeing prayers being answered. We're seeing services that are just, just incredibly full of the spirit of God. And we're seeing lives being changed. And I'm meeting with people that are just saying, pastor, I got to grow. I got to know more. We're seeing apostles and prophets and teachers and evangelists. And we're seeing these, these pastors, you know, growing and saying, I want to be a part of what God is doing here. And so now we're here tonight inside of a, a note burning ceremony where we're about to light the note that says what was once a debt held against you, held you in slavery is now you are, you are no longer a slave to that anymore. Now you are free and we are free in Christ Jesus here in this moment inside of this house, inside of inside of your, your, wherever you're watching now, wherever you're doing, inside of this moment, we're free to be able to experience everything that Christ has in store for us here in this moment. So I just want to encourage you here in this moment to worship the heavenly host and the angels are doing it with us. They are rejoicing and celebrating the goodness of God in this moment. And let us also rejoice because we are free and he who the sun sets free is free indeed. Amen. Amen. Amen.